to SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green, and joining me this week, as always, is science expert, Sari Riley. Hello. And our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. Hello. Should I pay for a blue check mark? Absolutely on not. On Twitter. No, no, everyone hates hates them well that's good then because <laughs> i got one for free for some reason and then i and then i turned it off by changing my name but then i kept all of the fun features like i get to post really long posts i get to edit my posts the show's gonna be such a great record of what's happening the, the, with the whole sort of the things that went down there's yeah. so few people in your position who can experience it from the place that you're experiencing it from, you know? Yeah. Well, what I didn't like is that when you click the little blue check mark, it said that I had <laughs> yeah, done a thing good. that I hadn't done. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. not good. And so I privated my account, and this is the real story, you guys. It's amazing. Oh. Twitter is so great when it's just the people. You and four already, million of your closest friends. Who already like me. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way to do it. It's it's uh it's not like uh a drama-free zone by any stretch of the imagination. But I had, uh, in the previous week, gotten a tweet sucked into the the sort of right wing of sphere, and oh. that always is really uncomfy. And yeah. now that doesn't happen because I'm private. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, you can't. Tough luck. Write him a yeah. letter. <laughs> Request it. <laughs> it's tough out here out in the mud on the other side of the fence. We're just yeah. slugging it out. Well, you could go private. That would be bad for us. I wouldn't like that. Yeah. That, yeah. What I if I say, yeah. oh, you should listen to Sasha Tangents? People wouldn't see that. Right. People need to see that. People need to see that. That's what it's for. Mm-hmm. You're the uh, SciShow Tangents number one fan, Sam Schultz. Yeah. I should say that I did a trivia night the other day uh, for Project for Awesome, and one of the categories was things you might have learned on tangents. And there was a person who got every single question correct. Wow. Incredible. Who had listened to every episode of SciShow Tangents multiple times. Ooh. Wow. And They're learning. I, it was a total joy. And I was like, there's stuff in that list that I didn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> every week here on SciShow Tangents, we get together to try to one-up, amaze, and delight each other with science facts while also trying to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for glory and for Hank Bucks, which I will be awarding as we play. And at the end of the episode, one of them will be crowned the winner. Now, as always, we're going to introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem. This week is from me. Outside is great. I love it. It's bay. But sometimes you want to keep outside away. And that's what the inside is for. It's so good, surrounded by concrete or metal or wood. It keeps out the cold or the damp or the heat. It keeps out the things that have too many feet. But there's one part (laughs) of out that we often want in. And when we can do it, it's such a huge win. When we're sleeping, we do want to keep out the night. But when we're waking, you have to let in that light. So melt down some sand and some soda and lime and lay it out flat and then wait for a time and then take out that stuff and put it in your wall and be careful not to hit it with a ball. Because inside (laughs) is great, but it's best of all when it lets in the things that we want to get in. Beautiful. The topic for the day is glass. Have you ever thrown something through glass that you weren't supposed to? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was a baseball and it was in my garage door glass. Classic. My garage does not have glass windows in it. But in Florida, every garage had had like a row of glass windows, yeah. which seems so dumb. Yeah. You see right in. It seems more expensive and worse. <laughs> yeah. But I guess it's so that you can see when the when you got, you know. If there's an alligator like, in there before you open it. Maybe. <laughs> gotta, That's gotta it. See. Yeah. Or outside before you're ready to go out. Oh, yeah. yeah. You can peep. Mm-hmm. There could be an alligator out there. Yeah. What are other <laughs> Florida dangers? You could just like... Avoid your yeah. neighbors, too, before yeah. opening your garage door. That's That would be my main use, I think, is to be like, oh. Right. Like, is anyone out there? Is anyone? I'm not ready to chat mm-hmm. right now, so. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Sari, what's glass? Uh, <laughs> glass? Glass puzzles a lot of people. I don't know if you get a lot of glass questions on TikTok. I get some glass questions. I feel like the, I feel like the confusing things about glass are mostly things that were made up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of lies <laughs> yeah. about glass yeah, out there. So, so glass is a non-crystalline, which Mm -hmm. means that it doesn't have a regular structure. Mm -hmm. Uh, So another way of describing that is an amorphous solid. Most of the glass that is around us, the main component is silicon dioxide, which is we can take from sand, quartz, uh, melted down, and then reformed into a shape that we wanted. There are other types of glass besides silica glass. For example, Mm -hmm. uh, CDs or DVDs. 
that really thin layer of glass oh. on there is also like an amorphous solid substance. It's calcogenide glass, which is okay. anything in group 16 of the periodic table. Oh, I just figured it was plastic. Yeah, there's a layer of glass over the the side with the movie on it. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, and so there are other glasses besides silica glasses out there. It's like, it's like cell phone glass, silica glass. Like, obviously, they've, mm. they've, they've done something to this glass to make it stronger. Yeah. Over the years. I think it is. I think it's silica glass. And, like, silica glass can be treated in a lot of different ways mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, so to make it stronger, there, it can be tempered, which is, like, heat treated. Um, there can be additives to it. So in the case of the glass on our, our phone, I don't know if there's any additives to like make it more conductive or mm. help with the thinness of it. I didn't look up cell phone glass. But by and large, the thing that we know how to, sh- to shape and to make and the reason why we have sand shortages is mm. the, the fact that um, silica glass is everywhere. And I think the, people, the reason why people get confused is because they think amorphous solid and they cling on to the word amorphous naturally right. because uh, some ways that chemists describe amorphous things is that it acts like a liquid like a liquid is an amorphous substance right which okay. is all the atoms and molecules don't really have kind of an order they kind of slosh around and there are a, there is like a liquid phase of of glassy materials which is if you watch any glass blowing shows where it's kind of like gooping <laughs> around but mm-hmm. after you quench it, when you cool it down to a point where it's solid, the, the atoms and molecules are locked into place. They're just all over the place. What, what, what? Yeah, they're just all uh, over the place. And so there's okay. this idea that, and I think floating around in science communication spaces, that glass is like a liquid. And so then people think that, right, if, that there, if there's so much heat on windows, mm-hmm. then it will gradually, gradually flow. But... It, it is a solid, and that flowing only happens over the, the course of, like, ridiculously, ridiculously long time scales. And one piece of evidence that people bring up for this is that if you look at stained glass windows um, in, like, medieval times, 13th century, then sometimes glass window panes are thinner at the top and thicker at the bottom because, mm-hmm. and they're like, ah, ha, ha, sun has been shining on this window, and it has been the liquid nature of the glass has been making it thicker at the bottom. But that is just because of how the, that glass was made. We didn't have a really good way of mm-hmm. making this big, even panes of windows that, that we make nowadays. Um, and they had to like basically make a big circle of glass and then cut out rectangles from it. And so there are naturally right. thicker and thinner spots. And it just makes sense to put the thicker spot at the bottom because then it's, it's more sturdy. More stable. Yeah. So, but it, is there a time scale on which, like, glass would flow? It would take billions of years to cause nano size alterations to the shape of glass. Oh, so, okay. so that's not. It's not that it doesn't flow. That's it's crazy. not that it doesn't flow. <laughs> but for us to notice it <laughs> that's in awesome. our puny human lifetimes, yeah. billions of Nine years close. for clarity. The whole time life has been around on <laughs> yeah. a substantial portion of the life of the universe mm-hmm. is what we're talking about here. And that's just for tiny changes? Is that what you for said? For nanoscale just changes. Yeah, for nanoscale yeah. changes. Okay. Not even like macroscopic. Boom. Definitely not windows melting. Yeah, right. I feel like we I feel like we uh, have, have done the work of SciShow Tangents. Yeah. We've been like, this thing that you heard about this thing, it's true, but only in the <laughs> most tiny possible way you could possibly imagine. Mm-hmm. It makes sense that people would think it's true, though, because what Sari said sounds more fake than that the glass is thicker at the bottom because it flowed down. And also, like, you look at old windows sometimes and they're, like, flowy. They look, like, yeah. wavy and weird, Whoa. and new ones don't, so I yeah. guess it's because they've had time to get wavy. But no, yeah. it's, mm-hmm. they were always wavy. And you see so much... Like the main times people see glass manufacturing is, I feel like glass blowing, yeah. Like, especially and with Netflix and glass blowing TV shows, and yeah. so they're like, "That's goopy." It is. Of goopy. course, <laughs> it must like revert back to the goop, mm-hmm. but we don't think about the big industrial processes that make the panes of glass that we use in windows or. You're right. Atriums That's, this is like the that. first time I've thought about that right now. <laughs> <laughs> And it's very different. It's like, we'll talk about it later a little bit. Okay. As part of the viewer mm. question. I researched oh, it. But it That's... it is like 
fascinating. And I didn't think about it before now either, because you think glass is goop and then it's not goop. Well, a little bit of foreshadowing for later in the show. But Sari, do you uh, know where the word glass comes from? So we actually, we're getting to the point in the show where I know just enough etymology to do this Mm -hmm. segment, but not enough etymology to separate the words that we've already talked about. Uh, So glass comes from the same root word as glow, uh, which is kind of like the the proto-Indo-European root gel, G-H-E-L, which means to shine. So glass, instead of being described as a material, glass was described by its property. It was like, oh, that's a shiny thing. And that's probably because natural glasses, like volcanic glasses that appeared, which was like Hmm. volcanic glass obsidian or um, desert glasses in uh, Mesopotamia or like North Syria, Egypt area that were formed by asteroids impacting the sand and like heating them up really hot were just shiny. And so people were like, ah, Mm. the the shiny thing. It's glassy. Mm. How long have we been doing glass for? That's a good question. At least since... Like the turn of the the before common era, common era. The history of glassmaking dates back to at least 3,600 years ago to Mesopotamia. I just knew that right off the top of my head. Isn't that, wow. Isn't that? <laughs> sounds, I, that hey, sounds I remember. Like the way you talk. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I feel well informed on glass, and that means it's time to move on to the quiz portion of our show. This week, we're going to play a little game called primary source. Sometimes the most fun thing that you can do with science is learn about how people used to talk about it. And luckily, thanks to the work of archivists and librarians and a lot of other people, it is easier than ever to find examples of texts in their original form so we can experience science in these other words. So today, in honors of the wonders of the internet, we're trying a a new game. It's called primary source. And I'm going to be reading to you a quote that comes from some kind of article or advertisement whose subject is related to glass. And I'll give you three options for what that subject is, and you get to guess. Does that make sense? We already know about this game to book. You already cleared it with us. Great, great, great. Round number one. In 1883, the Electrical Power Trade Journal, called The Electrical World, included a segment originally written by the London correspondent of the Philadelphia Telegraph. The correspondent had written of a growing trend uh, powered by electricity and included the following line. Any color can be got out of glass, and for a tiny peep of light, the smallest battery is necessary. What was the trend they were talking about? Christmas lights, electric jewelry, or flashing stained glass windows? Oh, electric jewelry. That one makes sense because of the tiny battery thing. What year was it? It was the year 1883. Were the rich people fancy enough to have electric jewelry? That does seem a little bit early to me to do anything except like have it in your house, I guess. I don't know. Rich people are going to rich, though. It's true. They're going to fight over blue check marks. They're certainly going to fight over. <laughs> oh, I have. you have a lamp in your house. I have one around my neck. And it's not going to be small and dainty. It's going to be like a big chonker. Of just yeah. like a full light bulb. The, the tiniest of batteries. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. I, Christmas lights just feels like tailor made to trick me. So I'm not going to guess mm. that one. <laughs> okay. And the stained glass window thing. I think it might be the stained glass window thing. I feel like that doesn't like support what is said in the article. But he's a newspaper man. He could be, you know, could be overblowing it. I feel like if if I was that time in England, knowing nothing about the socio-historical context, but just Mm -hmm. making vast assumptions. And you're from Philadelphia. Yeah. (laughs) And the church would be like, oh, how can we make our windows look a little, like people are over stained glass windows. How can we make them a little more fancy? A little light there. And then this rube walks by and goes, golly. Yeah. That's crazy. I think it's the jewelry. I'm going with that one. That's what my heart's telling me. I think it's the stained glass. Well, in the 18th and 19th century, electricity inspired a lot of inventions, including a trend in fashion. For example, electric jewelry. On stage, you could find electric headgear illuminating the performers, and eventually that trend spread to wealthy women in their fancy dresses. Uh, The article was published by The Electrical World, Uh which was a thing. 
Uh, and the writer says that uh, in the place of diamonds or rubies, the correct thing now, this is a quote, is to wear a star or brooch illuminated by electricity upon the left shoulder instead of the diadems at first worn at fancy balls. That's all uh, possible thanks to the uh, batteries, which a dressmaker told the writer could be expected to make ladies' dresses increase in size so that there would be <laughs> space to secure the battery. Mm. <laughs> Left shoulder is very specific. If you're right uh, shoulder, that's for your little parrot yeah, friend. Gosh. I was definitely yeah. picturing like a, a, like a little necklace with a little battery inside of it. Mm-hmm. But no, it's got you got to have a whole thing. You need a special dress to hold it. <laughs> <laughs> Round number two. In 1845, the British medical journal, The Lancet, featured an article containing the following quote. Artificial is but a very bad substitute for natural light. Plants reared in a strong artificial light will become green and grow, but the green is of a pale yellowish hue, and they are sickly looking and diseased. What was this article about? Was it instructions on molding glass for greenhouses, a treatise against the use of glass bulbs, or an argument against a tax on glass? Oh, Mm. interesting. Greenhouses make sense because they're like, can't just put a light bulb in a greenhouse. You got to have a window, big window. What was the middle one? Sorry, I missed it. The middle one was a treatise against the use of glass bulbs. Are they like, it's bad for plants and so it's bad for humans? I feel like that's the argument here. If the, if this was part of that treatise, oh. it'd be, man, like plants, they're sickly. Humans yeah. would also be sickly. Was the last one a tax on glass on windows? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So maybe that could be like, we need windows because our plants, mm-hmm. our plants need them. Please stop attacking them. But I think you're right, Sari. I think I'm just going to go with what you said. Oh, I, I think it's the, I think it's the window tax. Oh, I thought you said a tax so you- on windows. Like, hi <laughs> You meant taxing windows. Uh, just a bunch I thought people of kids were going around. Baseballs yeah. at yeah. windows. That's hilarious. Windows. A tax on windows. <laughs> a tax on windows. Well, you know, I stand by my logic. But I also stand by my answer. Well, it is indeed true that there have been a number of window taxes. Uh, The first began in England in in 1696. Uh, There was, uh, ideally, this was going to be a progressive tax. So you were, if you had a bigger house, uh, then you would pay more tax. And it would only be charged if you had more than 10 windows. And you wouldn't have 10 windows unless you had a really big house. Mm -hmm. And so that's only a tax on rich people. It turned out... Uh, actually, a lot of uh, people who are in the working class live in buildings with more than 10 windows because they live in apartment buildings. And so <sighs> those big tenement buildings uh, had to pay higher taxes. So they just started to board up the windows. <gasps> the landlords would board up what? the windows in their tenement houses so they didn't have to pay the tax. Uh, in addition to the window tax, the government later added a, a huge tax on glass in general, which amounted to 300% of its value. And the cumulative effect of these taxes was that people were living in homes without windows, which took a toll on public health. Uh, that doctors took note of. And in 1845, the Lancet article was written to celebrate the end of that tax on glass. The window tax took um, uh, a few years after that to repeal. Uh, In 1850, a motion to repeal the tax failed by three votes. It was finally repealed the next year. Was that just like, oh, the only way we can figure out how to tax rich people is counting windows? Is that what it was? Yeah, and what, 10? They were like, oh, 10. That's a lot of windows. Anything more than 10. Yeah. Well, in a hat, like, I mean, I have more than 10 windows for sure. But like, you know. la dee da. <laughs> I have five. So you I got have five. See, I have seven, actually. <laughs> They're small. Well, but you live in an apartment building. So you're I you live, live in an I apartment. Live in an apart- so so you're screwed. Would be boarded up. Yeah. My landlord yeah. would absolutely board it up and be like, no light for you. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Round number three. H. A. Ward's Natural Science Establishment was a company based out of Rochester, New York. The company is now known as Ward's Science, and it has a long history of selling various scientific materials. In 1878, H. A. Ward's Natural Science Establishment published a catalog full of detailed glass creations made by a man named Leopold Blaschka. 
who included the following caveat in the catalog. In the giving of orders, I must beg for as lengthened a time of a delivery as possible, as I make the models with the help of son Rudolf Blaschka alone, it being impossible to employ any other assistant in the manufacturing of them. <laughs> the prices are, comparatively speaking, so moderate that I cannot possibly allow any discount. The orders are not sent transport paid, packing, etc., done cheaply. What were Blaschka's glass creations? Were they microscopy slides with maps etched into them, sculptures of invertebrate animals, or snow globes of famous scientists at work? Oh, this is not <laughs> the guy who makes the... I mean, the guy and his son was making those those sculptures, right? I don't know what you're talking about. I forgot about that. Uh, okay. Is that this <laughs> Do I want to sabotage you or not? I, I know the answer to this. Oh, oh, you do? I love these guys. I think that, that since you said you love them, I think it's the sculptures. Because I was a guy and his son making glass. That couldn't possibly have happened any other time, right? <laughs> <laughs> but are you sabotaging me? I don't know. I don't know. I, why, am I, why am I sabotaging? Should I just guess? He does like yeah. very, very beautiful glass sculptures. He's the one who, who his exhibit is at the Harvard Natural History Museum, which if I can ever drag any of you to Boston, I will absolutely drag you to this museum. It is my favorite museum in the world because they do a bunch of like plant glass uh, mm -hmm. models and then also invertebrates. And it was very cool because they, like you can't really preserve the shape of a jellyfish mm -hmm. or a sea cucumber. Mm -hmm. you, can, right. you can put them in formaldehyde, but they lose some of the structural components. Right. But his art yeah. is so accurate, like pollen grains at 200 times their size mm -hmm. so that scientists have a 3D reference instead of a 2D drawing. Okay, well, I guess that's my turn to guess. I guess that <laughs> one. <laughs> I think you both got it right. <laughs> Sari, not playing the cards close to the chest no, there. Uh, she got really way too excited. <laughs> you, you started getting mad at me. <laughs> I wasn't being that devious. So yeah, for prices between fifty cents and six dollars and fifty cents, which if you had done that, you would have made some good decisions in your life. You could purchase a beautiful glass model of an invertebrate created by Leopold and Rudolf Blaschka. So. Yeah, they are beautiful and they are on display and you can go and see them and we should go and see them. Uh, they, they are incredibly detailed and they would often even add an egg wash to mute the sheen on the sculpture so it would look more like what the animal would look like uh, in the water. How are they looking at Wild. them? What did they, what did they do? Yeah, I guess they went into the water and looked at them. Yeah, they got okay. into boats. I think they did fishing boats. And so people would ship them fresh specimens. This is so... Like an Etsy page, though, like <laughs> it, it's it's like like you can really tell that like one guy complained about something and he was like, I'll write all next publication. You have to include this paragraph. And it's just like, no, sometimes customers are just angry and you just yeah. have to say no. No matter how hard your son works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just put him on the customer support part of it. That's the real that's the real solution to the problem. All right. Uh, you came out of that tied. Mostly because Sari gave it away. Next up, we're <laughs> going to take a short break. And then, the fact off. Now, get ready for the fact off. Our panelists have brought science facts to present in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they have presented the facts, I will judge them and award Hank Bucks any way I see fit. And to decide who goes first, I have a trivia question. Fulgurites are glassy tubes or crusts that are formed when lightning strikes sand, melting the sand and cooling it to form the tube. They're found throughout the world, but they're also rare and sometimes difficult to dig up because they are so fragile. In 1997, researchers at the University of Florida were at Camp Landing to study lightning when the ground was struck by a bolt. So they went out to excavate the fulgurite to make sure they didn't break it. They had to use a lot of care and a lot of special tools, and they were able to unearth a fulgurite with two branches. How long do you think the longest branch was? I don't know how far down the dirt goes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good thing to, to base it on, though. Yeah. Six feet. Six feet under. Oh, Six that's feet what under. I was going to guess. Uh, eight feet? The answer 
It's 17 feet. <gasps> wow. That's deep sand. Now, the shorter branch was 16 feet. <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> Sarah gets to go first. As we learned in Hank's poem, most of the glass around us, from mixing bowls to windows, is soda lime glass, which, if you know chemistry speak, tells us what it's made of right in the name. Soda is sodium oxide, lime is calcium oxide, and the glass, in this case, is silicon dioxide. And a relatively pure mixture of these compounds will give you see-through glass so that you can see what's outside without letting it in. So even if light gets bounced around a bit as it switches from traveling through air to traveling through glass, the atoms inside aren't absorbing and emitting any particular wavelengths of visible light. So to make colored glass, you need to add some extra compounds to it, usually some sort of colored particle or metal oxide that can be distributed throughout the structure of the glass or coated on top. And one of the coolest kinds of colored glass, in my opinion, is dichroic glass. Depending on the angle that light hits the glass object and then enters your eyeball, you'll see different colors because optics are super weird. Mm. And nowadays, most research into dichroic glass has to do with precise filtering for microscopy or spectroscopy sensors or even things like 3D glasses. But it can and has been used for artistic purposes too, even as far back as the 4th century in Rome that we know of. And one of the most famous examples of dichroic Roman glass is a well-preserved carved cup that depicts a scene from Homer's Iliad involving King Lycurgus. Uh, If light is shined directly onto the glass cup, so it reflects off the glass and into your eyes, the glass looks pale green. But if light is shined through the glass, the cup looks Mm. reddish pink. And it is like Mm. very wild how different It looks. And in studies of samples of the glass starting in the 1950s, scientists have learned that there's gold and silver distributed throughout the glass as tiny alloys and as pure nanoparticles. And from what we can deduce, it probably wasn't just by accident in the forge. This was an intentional mixing of these metals Mm -hmm. to make these colors. There's some evidence that glassmakers knew that adding gold particles could make glass red. Uh, That's like cranberry glass nowadays, even. Um, It's They mix in something else, but historically, if you mix in gold nanoparticles or very small chunks, it turns it red. Uh, So this might be further experimentation that took the color to a whole new level. In the 1960s, researchers even worked with a company called Corning Glassworks to try and replicate this specific dichroic effect, knowing what we know now about optics and nanoparticles, and they couldn't get it exactly the same, which I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, So it does seem like dichroism, at least when mixing metals and glass as opposed to careful coatings, is more art than science, and we have a lot to learn if we want to learn how to control optics in that very, very precise way. So this is like nothing to do with the coating on the glass, which we see a bunch. It's mm-hmm. like you could have a glass that's shiny and then you shine glass through it and you can't see the, the reflection anymore. But this is like the glass looks a color differently. Yeah. And like there yeah. are some inconsistencies within it. They didn't want to shatter the cup, obviously, because they're like, yeah. this is this very rare artifact. But found <laughs> fragments of the base like tucked inside um, and so they've like analyzed those fragments and they're like, even, even gotcha. across these fragments, there is different concentrations of silver and gold nanoparticles. So it looks slightly different. Um, but, but that same overall effect of like green versus red light. How do you make a nanoparticle when you're a, an ancient person, just a mortar and pestle? I think so. I think you just grind it. Zeus comes and helps you out. That's how they did it. Okay. Yeah. Hephaestus or, yeah. or whatever his name is. Yeah. is like Vulcan there. hit it with his hammer. Is like, it's just as welcome. dandruff. It just goes like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all ruined for us now because we invented these shampoos. Yeah. Our hair care got better <laughs> and our glass got yeah. less cool. Ah, who sacrificed a bottle of seltzer and blue to Zeus? Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. All right, Sam, what do you got? Okay. This is about something that's been big news, and I'm sure it probably won't blow Hank's mind because he's probably read all kinds of articles about it, but it blew my mind, and it's about glass. So let's talk about them glass beads up on the moon that they found. So people, for some reason, really want to live on the moon, and part of living anywhere (laughs) is being able to drink water. So a big part of moon research is trying to identify potential sources of water, and lots of experiments have shown that there is water in some form present on a lot of the surface of the moon, from the shadows of craters to the poles, and the fact that water seems to like collect on the poles of the moon even suggests that the moon might have like a water cycle of some sort. But you've seen the moon, 
There aren't lakes, there aren't rivers, there aren't even any damn puddles on the moon. So scientists want to know, where is this water, and how is it traveling around the moon's surface? When China's Chang'e 5 probe returned to Earth from the moon in 2020, it brought with it soil samples from the moon. A lot of it was what you'd expect, moon dirt. But in that moon dirt, (laughs) there were lots of these little glass beads in all kinds of shapes, sizes, and colors, which are formed when lunar soil is hit by meteors, which happens all the time. The fact that there were glass beads all over the moon wasn't surprising because the same thing happens on Earth when it gets hit by meteors. Sand and minerals fuse together into all kinds of glassy blobs called tektites, uh, but the surprising part is yet to come. So by 2022, seemingly everything that Chang'e had brought back from the moon had been looked at carefully, except for some reason, these little glass beads. So eventually, (laughs) a team of scientists took a peek at the beads, and what they found was evidence that they contained water. So meteors can have ice on them, but the scientists don't think that the water in the beads came from a meteor. In fact, and this might not really be related, but earthbound tektites are unique for their relative lack of water compared to other rocks and stuff because of the heat of the impact that forms them. And there isn't any like underground river that the meteors were stirring up or anything like that. So where do they think that the water came from? Partially from the dang sun. So solar wind is the stream of particles that flies out of the sun and Earth's magnetosphere, magnetosphere, whatever, blocks us from getting hit by the solar wind, but the moon's atmosphere pretty much sucks ass. So the wind hits the surface (laughs) where the glass beads are. And one of the things in solar wind is hydrogen atoms. And one of the things in the moon beads is oxygen from lunar soil. So what the scientist thinks happens is a meteor hits the surface and it makes these little glass beads with oxygen in them and they sit on the surface of the moon and they get bombarded by solar wind and the hydrogen in the wind interacts with the oxygen in the bead and it makes tiny little bits of water. And their evidence supports this hypothesis. The outside of the beads are covered in isotopes of hydrogen matching that in the solar wind and the beads have more water on the outside rims than when you get towards the center. Mm. So it seems like the beads on the surface are sweating out teeny bits of water all the time. And as the temperature on the moon changes, the water evaporates and travels to the poles. But there might also be tons of these beads underground still holding on to their water, making up a reservoir with possibly hundreds of billions of tons of water. Yeah, it's got to be tricky to get the water out of them. Well, yeah, maybe it'd be a big pain in the ass. It's sort of hard for me (laughs) to get excited about the part where it's like, well, now humans can go up and drink the water. But I do think it's pretty cool that so many weird cosmic flukes work together to make water Mm -hmm. on the dang moon. And imagine all the other crazy stuff that must be going on in space all the time. I want to picture that these glass beads I could like put on a string and make a necklace out of them, but I bet they're really small. I think some of them are kind of okay size, okay. but most of them are teeny tiny. Yeah. It clearly, um, the option is you stick all the glass beads in your mouth and kind of like suck the yeah, moisture suck on out of them. them. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> like an ice cube. That sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> you got to really wash them off first, and that's going to be require a fair amount of water on its own. Maybe just compressed air. You don't want to put lunar regolith in your mouth. Well, you don't know. Do you? It, it seemed to irritate the astronauts. Oh, right. Like, I forgot about like that. Like little shards. They did not of, like Shards it. of sharp yeah. stuff. Yeah. I think they just make them real hot and the water comes out. That's what their idea is. They just got to scoop it up. And then you can put them on a string and have a necklace yeah, because then, that, I do. Yeah, that's very cool. They're not going <laughs> to give you any of these, Hank. I'm sorry. I mean, eventually it won't be a big deal. Yeah. Eventually true. there will be so many of them that like they'll be three ninety nine on eBay. But that's, <laughs> yeah. will I be alive that's then? True. No. <laughs> so it's all about the future. Um, okay. I have to choose a winner now. The winner of this week's episode of SciShow Tangents is Sari Riley. Oh, I love wow. I love ancient technology, especially if it's unexplained. If there's still any element of unexplained, like they knew better than uh, they did, you know. All right, and that means that it's time to ask the science couch, where we've got some listener questions for our couch of finely honed scientific minds. At Will the Sun Card asks, why do glass shower doors sometimes explode? I worry about this all the time, especially tables. I worry about tables exploding. <laughs> I feel like every um, glass table explodes eventually. Yeah. Is that true? Well, I don't think so. Uh, uh, and they they do they seem to do it without cause. Yeah. So with a glass, I always thought with like a glass pane that's like part of a um, uh, shower situation, it's like clamped to the house. Right. And if the house settles or shifts <laughs> a little bit, it's like tweaking that glass and eventually it's just going to crack it. Oh. That's what I've imagined. But that's not what's happening with a table. I don't know the answer to this question. I mean, you got... You got there, kind of. Did I? Yeah. Okay. Um, basically, it's like 
it happens it happens less it, less frequently than you probably think i think it's like the the odds of it of a glass thing shattering spontaneously or not even spontaneously for a reason um right. is like less than half of the chance that you're going to be struck by lightning. No, what? because it happened in my brother's house. Yeah, it oh. happened at SciShow. That our quiz show table exploded. But I guess we spent like a decade hitting that really hard. So <laughs> <laughs> that's very weird. It's like <laughs> I've I've never heard of it happen to oh. anyone in my. Now I do, and now I know two <laughs> two things. <laughs> uh, but but it's usually one of three reasons. One is okay. like structural. Um, Like you both were saying, if there is some sort of crack or instability due to the way that it's it's clamped or if there's like a physical drop on it, um, glass and usually these like thin panes of glass are unstable enough that that crack will like propagate throughout it. And -hmm. specifically with a lot of these furniture glasses, the way that they're made is pretty consistent. So um, it is a kind of glass called float glass. Um, and this is like where you can get into the weird way that glass is made. They they float molten glass on a bed of molten metal of a very Whoa. low melting point, like, like tin, okay. which gives the sheet very uniform thickness and a very flat surface. It, <laughs> then they quench the glass all at once. So it's like flat and smooth and see-through and uh, a, a huge pane in the Wild. size that you want. And then... And does the, does the tin get quenched at the same time? Yes. That seems like it wouldn't work to me, but I guess it does. It does. And, and sometimes <laughs> as part of that process, there are impurities depending on the metal. And so like, this is why it is the cheapest way to produce large panes of glass, but also is imperfect. And so sometimes there are intrusions into the glass of like little flecks of metal, um, mm-hmm. specifically nickel sulfide inclusions in the glass. Um, and that can affect the glass's stability over time. Like these, these inclusions can sometimes grow over time or they just cause an additional stress point in the glass. And so if you have, glass that was manufactured slightly less carefully or tested slightly less for breakage, then there's this higher chance that a shift or bump will then shatter it. In addition to that, most of this like float glass after it's made goes through uh, like in pretty intense heating and cooling um, to, to temper the glass. And instead of shattering into big pointy dangerous shards, it'll shatter it into smaller flex that kind of fragmentation is known as dicing you can see it with like a windshield glass or you can see it i don't know in those videos where a table shatters or other things Mm -hmm. where instead Mm -hmm. of having pointy edges it's all rounded edges and i think part of what makes the shattering of of like a shower door so dramatic is when tempered glass shatters it doesn't just do one crack right it like goes like it, yeah, it, it doesn't crack ever it it turns into a t- like a million tiny pieces right. yeah so instead of leaving jagged edges behind it becomes these like relatively safe tiny yeah. pieces which is scarier from a like a um, <laughs> like looking at it yeah <laughs> yeah like if i see a, like a crack form in a door i'm like oh boy cracked that whereas if it's just like and just like <laughs> falls down like rain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, what's happening? But it doesn't chop all your toes off. Yeah. Is yeah. that the but thought? It's safe. Okay. When I was growing up, they made windows, like giant windows out of plate glass that wasn't tempered. And so if you if it, you like <clears throat> fell through it, it's like it's bad. Have a good time at have a good time at the hospital. I hope you live. Now you can somewhere. jump through them all day long. That's right. <laughs> Great. <laughs> it's my favorite. And and I guess the last little piece of this is that because glass is this amorphous substance, it still has characteristics of a solid of there are bonds holding things together. And so if one part gets hot and then immediately turns cold, or if one part is hot and one part is cold, then that can create like thermal Mm. shock or stress. And so Mm -hmm. in the case of shower doors, if you like blast hot water on it, Mm. and then all of a sudden blast icy cold water on it, then part of the glass might be expanding slightly and part might be contracting slightly. And that's enough. Mm. And so I think that's why maybe shower doors are the most dramatic example because there are such extreme temperature changes in that room. Well, I'm glad... To know a little bit, though, I I feel like Sari read propaganda from the glass manufacturers. I still think 100% of glass tables will explode eventually. Eventually. Yeah. 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 
They don't flow anymore. We changed the rules. Now they just explode. <laughs> well, if you want to ask the Science Couch your question, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents, where we'll tweet out the topics for upcoming episodes every week, or join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and ask us on our Discord. Thank you to Cascadia14 on Twitter, David Hurt on YouTube, and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. If you like this show and you want to help us out, it's so easy to do that. First, you can go to patreon.com slash SciShow Tangents to become a patron and get access to our newsletter and our bonus episodes and a special thanks to our patron Les Aker. And don't forget, once we hit 700 patrons, we are going to do a Minions movie commentary, so <laughs> go and subscribe. We're going to figure out what those little guys are full of. Spread the word. We have to see the piss. Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. It's super helpful and it helps us know what you like about the show. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, you can just tell, tell people about us. us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Terry Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz. Our associate producer is Faith Schmidt. Our editor is Seth Glicksman. Our story editor is Alex Billo. Our social media organizer is Julia Buzz Bazayo. Our editorial assistant is Devoka Chakravarty. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Caitlin Hoffmeister and me, Hank Green. And we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. Across medical literature, most of the time when you read about glass and butts, it has to do with so-called foreign bodies, which is a jargony <laughs> way of saying that people get a glass object stuck in their rectum no, no. and need it surgically removed. Carefully. However, it can be helpful for doctors to put a very thin piece of glass up your butt, specifically yeah. fiber optic instruments that can be used to image your colon or other parts of your body. But hey, this is a butt fact, so we got to do the colon. So yes, glass and butts can be compatible, <laughs> but you got to make sure it's a technology that's meant to be there. Wonderful. I'm having a colonoscopy soon myself. Well, I'm Good glad time. that we could tell you a little bit and more I'll, about what was going to happen. And I'll happen. say to the doctor, shove that glass up there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole, it is a whole thing. And you're, you know, you know that you're not the only butt that thing's been in. <laughs> oh, oh I didn't yeah. think about that. Yeah, they clean it really good. They know how to do it. You got to buy your own and bring it. it bring it to them from home. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in the dishwasher. Yeah, just get a garden hose <laughs> and some glass. <laughs> <laughs>